Hey, bro. Hello. Oh, brother, how you been? Good, good. How's it going? Huh? How's it going? It's going good. I'm actually in service. Well, I'm about to start uh, my church service over here. But look, I had a question pertaining, a quick question pertaining to uh, Judges chapter 11. What's that about? Uh, j Path sacrificing his daughter. Oh, uh, yeah. He really sacrificed his daughter? Uh, not according to, well, yes, it seems like it, right? Because she goes up there, like up in a mountain to, to cry with her friends. She bewildered. Did she bewildered her virginity? It's a problematic story. I don't know what to do with it. And she was obedient, but she was obedient. She was like, you know what? I'm willing to do this. And it's crazy because when, before he made that vow, before he made that oath, it's the Bible records J Path or whatever his name is. It records. He said uh, the spirit came upon him and which led him through these cities. And then he made the vow. So was he spirit led whenever he made the vow? This is why I don't consider books outside the Torah the word of God. Okay. Um, it's 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 historical as you know like judges or or scribes trying to give over a story and a lesson but only because the rabbis put together some books doesn't mean we have to call it the word of god the torah that we got this on mount sinai that i mean the text itself says it's the word of god but all these other extra books i believe they could have mistakes in them okay okay i just i just wanted to but according to the text he did sacrifice his daughter right well it doesn't say it, but it leads you to believe that that's what happened right unless yeah. he changed his mind in the last minute or somebody called the cops on him or something yeah because i mean the only thing that it does say is that he did with his daughter according to uh to the uh sacrifice or the the burnt offering or whatever and i was like wow okay so now, then i went back to leviticus and read about the burnt offering i was like man he did that all to his daughter that's crazy yeah it's because he took an oath was it a vow or an oath i don't remember what it was and then he felt obligated to keep it which is a stupid oath to begin with that he's going to sacrifice i guess it makes sense that you're going to sacrifice what you're able to sacrifice there's no there's no way to sacrifice the whole story was beautiful, though. Man, when I when I was reading it, bro, like there was tears running down my eyes. I was like, man, the that story is... story doesn't make sense because there's a prohibition in the Torah to bring sacrifices outside of the place that God chooses. So this was, uh, back then, it was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And they wouldn't yeah. let them sacrifice a human. So whether it was a burnt offering or whatever... The, he was forced to offer that sacrifice in wherever the tabernacle was at at, the, at that time, and they wouldn't let him sacrifice a, like a human. So yeah. it probably doesn't make sense to me. Yes. And he was yeah, this, going, guys. Um, from Joseph, right? Uh, like, I don't know what tribe he's from. I don't know All right, bro. All right, so we'll talk after you get out of service. Yes, sir. God bless you. Be careful. It was All nice right, talking to you. All right. Uh, welcome, user. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. What's up? Hey, uh, I just I saw something interesting. I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. But I saw that China is talking about moving into Gaza. I don't want to talk about, about, about how like, under the Jewish faith, I don't. Yeah, um, the, the descendants of Abraham are determined, or are they're gifted? You know, the the land of Israel, and so if. Well, that's not true, actually. That's not true. There are the descendants of Abraham? Like Abraham. Like, if it's the descendants of Abraham, then the land would become, like, would belong to Amalek or, or, or Edom. But they're also descendants of Abraham. It's people who are like Abraham. That means religiously inclined individuals. So I would say probably 80% of people who live in Israel aren't religious. So how can that land belong to them? I don't know. Like, to me, it doesn't make sense either. But from what I've studied, that's the basis for moving into Palestine and no, evacuating yes. people. Is where they identify as descendants of Abraham. But yeah. but my point is, yeah. I think that's how the, the Chinese view it, too. And they're trying to move in. And it's, you know, this is, I think this is a part of the Jewish faith, right? The Christians believe that the children of Abraham are people who believe in Jesus, right? So there's a distinction there, but, but 
for the Chinese to move in, it's kind of like they're dunking on the Jews according to their own rules. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. I don't know. I think that's an unsubstantiated claim that the Chinese are moving into Gaza. Oh, that, there, there are articles in the last couple of days. They're, they're talking about it. Oh, they may be talking about it, but the U.S. one that wouldn't allow it. Yeah, that sounds unbelievable. Yeah, and also um, that would be like World War Three because America is so allied with Israel. If the Chinese went into the Middle East and they're in Gaza trying to fight for the Palestinians, that'd be like war. Well, wow. Israel, what they say is they're going to help with the redevelopment. Like they're implying it would just be like economic support. But, oh, you know, really, if they're paying yeah, for it, they're going to have a lot of leverage. And so anyways, yeah, well, the war would have to end for that to happen. Anyways, I don't want to talk about politics. It's, it's a plus claims that are a bit unsubstantiated. It's fine. Theo Vaughn in the house. Hello. What's up, Theo bro? Vaughn. Uh, it's been a while. It's How's life? Good. good, 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 good. How's work? Uh, good. Thanks for asking. Uh, how's your mom? Good. My mom is actually great. It's we great. recently did this thing where, like, over the last few months, we've been raising chickens, and they finally started laying eggs, bro. Wow, that's it. You guys are never going to go hungry now. Exactly. They taste amazing too. Like, it tastes like if you get an egg and turn the flavor dial up. Like, that's what it tastes like. <laughs> flavor dial on those eggs. Yeah. yeah. And what's really interesting is we have some lavender chickens, and so some of the eggs are popping out green and blue. Okay. All Isn't right. that cool? Do you live in a farm or something? Or what? Well, we're thinking about turning our property into a farm. We're thinking about maybe cows next, but my mom says cows are so hard to clean up after, and you have to milk them every day, evening and morning. And You're I'm in thinking, Oklahoma, right? Uh, Tennessee. Close enough. Mm -hmm. oh, that's where the hot tula girl's from. It, is it? Yeah, she's from Tennessee. Bro, you know she's like Ashkenazi Jewish? No, get the heck out of here. Really? <laughs> she is, yeah. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, you know, I, she's just a normal girl, but if it, Yeah. She was drunk and she just made a silly comment. But I know. Yeah, but she's profiting off it and she could have just ran away from it. But she's Ashkenazi Jewish. So what's her name? You know? Uh, Haley. Yeah, no, but her last thing. Is it like Lipschitz or... Um, Let's see. What's funny is you literally Google Hawk to a girl. <laughs> Hawk to a ministries. Let's, yeah, right. Let's see. <laughs> Haley Welsh. Her name's Welsh. Yeah, I guess I could go. I mean, was Rachel, Raquel Welch Jewish? Probably. Well, she got like a DNA test on like a uh, like podcast and it came up 97.7 Ashkenazi Jewish. Oh, okay. Well, that doesn't mean anything. That could be, you know. Yes, it does. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but that doesn't mean she's religious. Like she's Oh no, she's Jewish. definitely not a religious Jew. Lord have mercy, because she was out at a bar, then made sexual jokes and stuff. Okay. And most You're Jewish. Letting Ash down. Ash is in the comment with the face palm, you know. Like, oh, you know. is that to me? I think they know no, me. No, it's actually. to me, I guess, because I'm, I'm the grown up in the room. <laughs> yeah. What am I then? Huh? Like you're the hot tool boy. Right. Right. <laughs> I think what they thing. tried to do is kind of like the Cash Me Outside girl where she turned it into like a YouTube career and then like Cash a... Cash Me Outside. Well, yeah, yeah. I think they yeah. tried to kind of do that, but it didn't really work as well. Well, uh, yeah, she made it big. Right. Funny, I was watching a TikTok little clip with Dr. Phil explaining the whole history behind this Cash Me Outside girl who's quite wealthy now. Right. From OnlyFans, too. Oh, is it? Oh, I yeah, think it's for reasons. Well, I mean, I guess you don't have to do inappropriate stuff in OnlyFans. You could have, uh, I'm curious. I mean, you could have like a tour star, the, you know, like a tour study in OnlyFans and just. Yeah. <laughs> That's what that girl did. Uh, there was an OnlyFans girl who did straight up porn. And then like she converted to Christianity and said, I'm bored again. And now I'm a whole different person. And then she started trying to do like, I guess, Bible studies on her OnlyFans. I don't know, man. Don't love men's no more. <laughs> I love women's, 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 women's. <laughs> I don't love men's no more. <laughs> That's one thing is like in Christianity, like you can go out and just like slaughter a group of people, children. Bro, and use then, different terminology. We're going to get this thing. Oh, my bad. But then you, if you say, I'm bored again, it's like, okay. I have a big problem with death. You can't just say it. You have to mean it. You can't just say it. You have to mean it. I get it. it. Yeah, but it, it still makes How the How do you know when someone religion? means it? Well, like whether the person gets eternal life or not, religious people pay the price for it because it makes us look primitive. Like instead of saying, like, you know what, um, deathbed con deathbed confessions might exist. We won't know. You know, I guess you'll know after you die, right? But to make it like a rule, 
Like if you accept Jesus right before you die, he forgives you for everything you did bad to other people. You know, like I don't even think that God forgives your sins um, when they're at the expense of other people, because then that would make him unjust, right? I mean, this whole thing about God turning your sins as red as scarlet, like white as snow, that, that can apply. I mean, if somebody steals my car and then God forgives him in my behalf, I mean, right. that's, that's kind of like, you know, that's right. stepping your bounds, God, right? <laughs> no, you row, no, you row, right? But, I mean, it's kind of like the American legal system. I mean, somebody steals your car, but they pay their debt to society by, by working for the man in prison. I mean, like, who's going to pay for my car? My yeah. Gonna go yeah. It's these people don't when they make these claims, I don't think they think it out. There's there's a practice in the Jewish world called Kol Nidre. That during Yom Kippur, it's interesting, Kol Nidre doesn't appear in the Gemara, doesn't appear in the Rambam. It, I saw a source that it appeared somewhere in the Gaonim. Um, but the problem of Kol Nidre is the idea that God ignores or overlooks any vows you may have made that year. Now, if you really, like, if the text is more problematic than the explanation, because if you ask most most rabbis, they'll be like, no, Kol Nidre covers what's called mitzvot ben adam de chavero, like, um, uh, or mitzvot, you know, like, averas ben adam de chavero, like, between man and man, sins between man and man, and not, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's, <laughs> like a various, uh, um, between man and God, and not between man and man. Oh, look at this, huh? When you live in the city, they're interrupting us, man. How could they be so rude? No, it's some okay. There we go. Okay, yeah, it's been a long time, man. How you doing? <laughs> oh, man, look at you back from the dead. Back from no. the dead. How are you doing? You're like an Before Asian you go to the right new now? guy, I was here and I had a yeah, question. Yeah, my bad. I just want to say what's up. No, anyways, I wanted to say that it's problematic to believe that God's going to forgive your sins or annul your vows that you made to other people. That's a problem, right? Um, so now, God isn't omnipotent? Did you say God's not omnipotent then? How does that have to do with God's omnipotence? Well, no, yeah, that has nothing to do with He's God. saying that, like, if I go and murder somebody and God forgives me, how does that help the murderer, like victim? They're still dead. So that's not what he said. He said, how does God know if you mean it, is what he just said. No, that's not what I said. I you, said that it's yeah, unjust. You did. Maybe you didn't mean to say it, but that's what you said. Well, that's not, like, if that's what I said, then, then I didn't mean to say it. What I meant to say is that it's unjust and unbecoming of a good God to, to um, erase your sins that you made to other people instead of you making amends, asking for forgiveness, all of the above, right? He should be like ethically only able to forgive sins between you and him. Like you broke the Sabbath or you didn't keep kosher or like any, any, um, like Avera, any sin between man and God and not man and man. If you sin against somebody, you're supposed to make it right with that person and ask for forgiveness from God both. Hmm. So what is that? I mean, how does that change anything I just said? You know, so like, if someone you're, you're claiming you're claiming that's all, the only Jews think that that's that's the problem of what you're saying. No, that's not what I said. I'm specifically talking about Kol Nidre. Specifically talking about Kol Nidre. Christians also say the same thing with the whole deathbed confession that you could have heard as many people as you want. If before you die, if you truly, truly are sorry, uh, and you ask Jesus into your heart, He'll take your sins, although they're as red as scarlet, and make them as white as snow, and let you into heaven. So, can you note also, I think for the persuasiveness is your point that you also were once a Christian and that maybe, did you, when you were a Christian, did you not believe that this was the case? Oh, I, I, I've evolved. There's things I believe nowadays that I did no, not no, believe no. 20 years ago. I'm not, I'm not yes. saying this as an indictment. I'm saying like uh, someone, a Christian might say, well, that's what it seems like to a Jew. What's a Torah only Israelite? But the reality is, no, I think really on consideration that even as a Christian, at the end of the day, that is kind of what I think. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. problematic. Yeah, I, I've been here for a while and was very it's quiet. It's not that problematic. And waiting it's my turn. Like, yeah, go ahead. So what is the significance of the Jews going up Temple Mount yesterday? What is oh. the religious significance of that going forward? I didn't know they went up to the Temple Mount. You mean you're in Tishabov? Why am I a better Jew than you? Huh? 
Oh. Ben Gavir did. I, oh, yeah. well, I mean, he's not religious, is he? I mean, I'm not uh, up with Israeli politics. Are you serious? Yeah. I think Ben Gavir Israeli is Israeli politics. Religious. I mean, it's it's um not tied with Judaism. It's not it's just it. politics. He went to the temple. There was a whole bunch of them that went to the temple, laid down and prayed. I came up to ask, what is the significance of that going forward? As far as what will happen next, possibly the third temple, etc. Oh, nothing, nothing. I mean, the it's Antichrist is coming. No, okay, I'm kidding. So, I mean, as someone who lived in Jerusalem for for over five years, or at least near to it, um, every morning, well, it used to be like this around 7 a.m. They allow people, Jews, to go up to the Temple Mount, not to pray. So wait, wait. Do you're, hey, listen, from what I read or heard. You're not. You're supposed to say stay outside the walls. And then yesterday, Ben Gavir went inside the walls where Jews haven't been since like 70 A.D. No, that's incorrect. I mean, again, I'm not sure. Can you please look it up while I'm on here, please? Uh, well, you brought it up. I, mean, I can't be. I brought it up, but you don't know about it, and I can't believe you don't know about it. Yeah, because I don't follow well, Israeli politics. I mean, I'm actually Israeli. It's not just really politics. politics. Yeah, it's but, not just politics. You've told me before that if given the opportunity and a third temple was created that animal sacrifice would have to come back yeah true yeah. or false there you go okay came up here to ask about that since it looks like it may be going towards that yeah, and you right. don't know about it so You're i would no think you would want to look it up on your own honestly. there's no section okay i'll tell you for a fact as someone who worked with someone who who ran tunnel tours every day in the old city there's a tour that goes under the the western wall under the dome of the rock there is no section that jews haven't visited you know for more than 70 years that 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 anybody knows exists all right i mean perhaps there's a section that we don't know about right but the jews the archaeologists are there There, there's no such thing (laughs) as as a spot that once you enter but since 70 ad like it was there trust me some zealot some 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 kach guy like a kahana guy would have snuck in there already Okay, I mean, it, like in 770, they're digging holes. It's not easy. It, like, it, like, it's not hard. Like the Rova kids, like to sneak in some forbidden place. Trust me, people have been trying to pay. Okay, okay. So I just left that they were celebrating what happened yesterday, and so I thought I would leave that live and come and ask you your opinion about it. It was a live, all Jewish live, and they were talking about it, and I'm repeating everything I just heard from them. Right, so they probably so don't know. that's why I'm coming here asking you about it because they acted like it was a huge event and meant so much thing so much so many positive things for the Jews going forward so I came up here to ask you about it all right I'm gonna go to J post like, I mean I mean I have to go to Arad Sheva to see like so, if it's so popular I mean it'd be somewhere here so quick quick question in the meantime um, you know like the uh, the what's the equivalent in Judaism of the Pope and then, like maybe um, the Amir Amut, meaning like the leader of the faithful in Islam. Who's who's, who's the top dog? Like the holy priest? The Kohen Hagadol, yeah. Israel? You mean biblically? I yeah. haven't had one since seventy. I know, but if if it was happening, like who's 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 the the top G? Is it the king or the the chief priest? Would we'll talk in what regard? Like the king is political and war, right? But the high priest, the Kohen, is like religious. Okay, so they're co-equal, basically. Like, it depends on what the topic is. Like, if it's a religious matter, they're probably going to go to the Cohen, and if it's a political okay. thing, they're going to go to the King. No, that makes sense. Although there's rumors, uh, this could be true, this could not be true. Apparently, some guy is going to come, and he might be both or something. I don't. Know. <laughs> I don't know. No, but don't you think King David like was superior to whatever chief priest was around at his time, though? Don't you think he was? It may, maybe the the first among equals. King David was pretty sick, yeah. Yeah, I think that I think the king has to take like a higher role. It's still distinct from the priest. How would a king have a higher role in religious matters than a priest? I didn't say in religious matters. I just said in in most things. Oh yeah, I mean if you kind of like insinuating in religious like, matters, if you're a leader, they would take you to the king. How, how do you weigh or measure quote unquote most things? Like what are most things? Like, I think um, I, like does the king decide who gets to sit on the Sanhedrin? Can the king appoint people to the Sanhedrin? That's an interesting question. Yeah. If he can, then he then he definitely does have control over most things. He can 
he can okay. choose when to raise the army. Um, he can choose like, I don't know. Uh, Rabbi, I think that's a good answer to the like, question. Yeah, that is an answer to most things. Yeah, because the Sanhedrin does. I don't see out. anything here. I mean, I see that it says that he went up to the Temple Mount, but I don't see any religious aspects. It's the problem is that the same thing happened when Netanyahu went to the not to the Temple Mount, but he went to the Western Wall. And that all the Arabs get upset because their whole thing is that they're undermining Al-Aqsa or the Dome of the Rock or the Mosque of Omar or whatever. All right. That it's that they're undermining it. But in terms of religious significance, I don't see it anywhere. Like if someone wants to come up and share it to me, I mean, as someone. But anyways, I was telling the story that there's the Western Wall and there's the Harabayat. The Harabayat is the, the, the Temple Mount, essentially. So when I used to live there till I think. At 7 a.m., they open up the Temple Mount for Jewish people to allow to go, uh, to be allowed to, to to go up in the Temple Mount. Religious people typically go with a map. That maybe they maybe I misspoke. Maybe I misspoke. Maybe it wasn't Temple Mount. Maybe it was... I found anyway, something about it where it says that basically Gavir just went up there, being um, escorted by Israeli police, and said, "Our policy is to enable Jewish prayer." And like just kind of gave a speech or something and talked about winning the war in Gaza. But I don't see anything about them praying or anything like that. All right, anyways. So the practice I li I literally just saw pictures of Jewish people laying down on on their stomachs and praying. You're right, I'm explaining I'm making this. this up. I just left. Yeah, guys, 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 guys. He just thinks it's the greatest. Guys, guys, guys. Hey, listen, 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 listen. I mean, not to toot my own horn, but most of these Israeli lives are not from people who have ever been to the Temple Mount who've ever been in you, like my yeshiva was in front of the Kotel, right? I mean, I've been there a few times. The practice is early in the morning, people go up there with jackets on and they'll put tefillin under their jacket. That means they'll wear their shalyad, but they won't wear their, the, you know, the head tefillin, the shorosh. And the practice is when you're walking around the Temple Mount and the guard is not looking, our practice was to throw ourselves in the ground because that's the halacha. Like only like on the Temple Mount are you allowed to pray on stones. Like everywhere else, you're supposed to have a separation. So everybody does that, gets up and goes around because that's a form of worship. According to Halakha, that's what you do like in, like in the temple. I doubt he did that, right? But it's a common thing, right? Because like only like the hilltop settlers do this, like the Kahana guys, the Rambam guys. Uh, it's, it's not a common thing. And one, if they catch you, you can get in trouble. Uh, but this is a very common thing that's done on the Temple Mount in the morning, because that's the only time religious Jews are allowed up on the Temple Mount, at least when I was there. Uh, it's Don't they just dress up as Muslims and go I in? Think, I think that's what the big thing was, is that they did it and didn't get in trouble like they have like they thought they may. Like They took a stand and they said, we're not going to listen to this anymore. If we want to come up here and pray, we're going to come up here and pray. Right. I think as a Christian, you'd be well, and I say this as a Christian, I think for you, I fish, it would be fruitful for you to maybe lay aside some of the hysteria as it when it comes to Jewish things and become more listen, serious. Listen, about listen, listen, I know where you're going with this. And I am, I have no theories about the third temple in apocalypse. I never even knew that existed until now. a couple months ago. Yeah, you just I grew did. Up, man. I did because I don't like you talking down to me. I really don't. <laughs> you can talk to Listen, man, you know, really, you, really uh, unnecessary. Uh, uh, Rabbi Asher, I have a question. Okay. Can the king appoint people to the Sanhedrin? I wonder okay. that too. What do you think, well, Rabbi? Okay. According to Jewish law and Jewish tradition, now it's it's not like this in the Torah. The king himself had smicha, right? All the Ooh. priests had smicha, which is ordination going back to Moses. One person who has smicha could give smicha to somebody else. So technically, yes. Um, so then the king definitely does run the show like he is he is no. the top of the chief priest no the not well it depends because the sanhedrin has nothing really to do with spirituality it has to do with law so there's 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 the legal aspect of judaism and the spiritual you know aspect of judaism where well, the legal is run by the nasi who's the head of the sanhedrin and the spiritual is run by the high priest now it's interesting that in Tanakh it says that that the word was it 
the law of God will come forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. I think that's how it says the word. The word became flesh or something like that. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. no I mean, it's in the Jewish Bible like this saying why? Because it seems that authority, legal authority was on the king because who lives in Zion? The king, the king, right? I mean, King David's palace is in Zion in what they call the city of David today. And who lives in Jerusalem? The high priest. Right. Well, Jerusalem is not. So Jerusalem today is not biblical Jerusalem. Um, the old city of Jerusalem today is biblical Jerusalem. And you know, the Jews today aren't the biblical Jews. No, I'm, pl I'm playing. I'm playing. <laughs> well, okay, no. Doesn't even mean to be the biblical Jew. So Judaism, um, like Jerusalem is probably like 90% larger than it was in biblical time. I mean, probably more than that. Like it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's massive. Yeah. And, the old city like you could walk around the old city in like 30 minutes but you, so you're saying it's in the right place it's just smaller uh no well yes what even the old city of jerusalem now i believe was was um expanded because it was actually sh like smaller but it was expanded by the muslims okay so do you think do you think the second temple is like under the dome of the rock no i mean for sure the temple is now you mean the 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 holy of holies um yeah. no like don't you think the muslims built their their thing on top of ours like well i mean you have to understand when they built it so by that time it was all torn down anyways yeah it was gone well, the oh, okay, rock is from the year 800 um something like that like 600 is when they first came i think well, it can't be 600 no. muhammad, no, was, after that. Yeah. muhammad, was, muhammad was unalived in 632 yeah Just, but maybe maybe you guys don't know about me Maybe you guys don't know about me. For the last 10 months, I've been going on pro-Israeli lives, fighting for Israel, fighting for the Jewish people. So whatever you thought I may have been earlier is a misconception of who I am and what I am. I spend many hours a day on this app fighting for the Jewish people and fighting for Israel. So no, I am not hysterical about anything. No, um, you're based. As far as it comes. To, as far as it comes. You're a little animated it. today, I think. Like, kind Dude, of, uh... it, it is almost 8 o'clock. The girl that works for me, her grandpa died today. I was shorthanded. I've been running around like crazy at work, okay? No problem. So, what business do you I'm run? A, I own a pharmacy. I have a far, doctor of pharmacy degree. Oh, oh cool. cool. And I own my own independent pharmacy. Okay, so hook this all up with Percocets. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so I'll tell I just, you. I just don't know why we keep talking about the Jewish people, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually heard people on TikTok like, man, they Jewish. They not even Jewish. <laughs> Here, look, Israel's a secular country. They don't have any religious aspirations. Okay. Yeah. Even even the religious parties are there just to get more money for people with large families. They don't they, Israel had the Temple Mount in 1967 and they gave it back to the Arabs. They don't want a temple. Okay, so I wouldn't worry about them trying to build it. I mean, can you imagine that? Uh, first of all, the only thing that the religious Jews run in Israel today is marriage and conversions. And, and even that they're taking away from them because it's a joke. They run it like a joke. Nobody takes them seriously. How, how are they going to, i.e. to build another temple means that they will have to move the Mosque of Omar, the Dome of the Rock, and then Al-Aqsa. They're going to have to move it. They're going to start world, like world War III just to give Orthodox Jews anything. Nobody respects Orthodox Jews in Israel. So, like, I wouldn't worry about that. They yeah, that's the thing, is to build it, you'd have to destroy that mosque. And you destroy that mosque, you're going to make 1.89 billion people angry. Uh, based? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, most of these Israeli lives on TikTok are run by people who've never visited Israel. Not, I'm saying most of them. and I'm, I'm sure there's an exception. And almost 99% of them are irreligious. So, they don't know anything about Jewish law. In terms of the people, the, temple. the people on this specific live were Jews in Israel. The uh, like six out of eight of them. Yeah. And they acted like it was the greatest thing in forever. So well, I thought, religious. I thought, Rabbi, no. I thought it was a great thing, and I think it's a great thing for you guys to be able to go and do and worship however you want to wherever sure. you want. Oh, incorrect. So that's why I came up here to talk about it. Well, in my and it got twisted into something else. Okay. All right. Like, I don't want religious people controlling Israel because they're going to screw it up. Right? Everything religious Jews touch, they destroy. Everything. All right. 
first we have to get our act together before we would ever dream of building a, yep. a you know but, third but you're stuff. you're a religious jew though yeah Got him. so you're talking about yourself too right <laughs> oh Head absolutely shot. yeah no i'm not trying to build into the temple now you see it's 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 a group of people you know like it like if we, okay if we would build another sanhedrin let's say and who's gonna run it Fatmer, Habad, like if we build another temple, you know, Todal Saren, Bells, like who's going to run it, right? These people are backwards, they're primitive, they mistreat converts, they make Jews look ridiculous. I mean, only because I'm religious doesn't mean I should lie and acknowledge that everything works fine in the religious world. We're not organized enough to run anything right now, religious Jews are not. So, it really, oh. what? It really does seem like to some degree it's like one major... Uh, I think a term like something like a KPI would be a change in the Jew religious Jewish attitude uh, towards converts and Gentiles in general and their viability as potential Jews. And it seems, is there any other major KPI that, that I mean, that's a, that would be a KPI that would indicate that the, I, I just learned a new word, but that would indicate that the Jewish religion is going in the right direction. So it's interesting because people never talk about the cardinal sins in the Torah. What are the actual cardinal sins? I mean, people know about the three sins that you're supposed to um, allow yourself to be unaligned for. Those are familiar, but they're not from the Torah. Well, they're rabbinically from the Torah, but it's not, you know, in terms of like unaligning somebody else, uh, like sexual immorality and idol worship. The Torah is clear that the thing that God hates the most is Israel mistreating the con the convert, the widow and the orphan. orphan. Correct. You know, it says that God himself would destroy the Jewish people all over this. That's why Jews are still in exile today. That's my opinion. So I believe that also. I believe that also because they have no issue making Judaism very ethnocentric, which it seems that that's what God is against. The whole agenda of Kabbalistic Judaism is is to instill ethnic Jews with pride, with the sense of superiority um, to their, I don't know, captors, to their host nations, all this stuff, instead of saying, no, you know, we are nothing. What makes us special is Torah observance. That's not what's being taught. The message that's being the giving over by most Jews is the message of Korach. We're all the people of God. We're all special. Nonsense. That's Nonsense. interesting that you compare it to Korach. 100%. You know, so like, it's, I'd rather Israel stay secular. Okay. I see an interesting typology here between you and this, uh, and, I, and I mean this in good faith, between you, and your assessment of the situation of the Jews in the present moment, and Paul's assessment of the Jews during Christ's time. Paul's uh, great contention was that the Jews were treating, at least the Jews who were Christians that he was dealing with, were treating uh, Gentiles as if they were, you know, less than or something. They were, they were being... Un ungodly, na uh, what's the word? Ungodly, uh, ethnocentric, as you put it. Yeah, it's very problematic. Your algebra, go ahead. I mean, you have to I, shut. I me. literally was thinking the exact same thing. Me and you got off to whoever just spoke. Me and you got off on the wrong foot. I literally was just thinking the same thing. So God bless you, brother. He's a modern hey, day apostle, this rabbi. Everybody else on the panel. I mean, it's, it's the point. There's a similar dynamic too. I mean, the, the, there is. Yeah, hold on, hold on. I want to hear from algebra because I think uh, I mean I let people who are religiously Jewish on first. I mean you have the name Pashat in your handle, but you must be from. Like, go ahead, algebra. Yes. Um. So I'm Christian. Um. <laughs> I, he's not a minion. He's not in the minion. <laughs> I actually uh, wanted to say. That, um. I use well, not me. Others before me have used um, Ezekiel four verses five through seven, where the prophet Ezekiel um, acted out the siege of Jerusalem for 390 days for Israel, 40 days for, Is for, for Judah, and Leviticus 26, 27 through 33, but the seven times is, is all throughout. That's also mentioned by Rabbi Tobias Singer um, in regards to the sins being multiplied by seven. So basically I use that to um, show that the exiles of Israel and Judah both converged the end of it in 1967. Oh, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that at all. I don't believe in the shock is supposed to end the exile, isn't he? He's supposed to end Gula? Ooh. The caveat is that I'm using the same 360 day, 360 day year measurement that Christians use for Daniel 9. 
to well like to to show like the perfect fulfillment of you know the messiah being um unalived or cut off no, after the nine weeks. when i interpret daniel 9 as i believe 406 years in the past not 406 years in the present it's yep. like 77s so that means 70 shmita years were missed in a total of 490 years i'm sorry right and so they had to go into exile because it says in leviticus that god will allow the land to lay fallow to make up for the time that was missed during the Shemitah years. This is why, but how many Shemitah years are there in 490 years? 70, because you know, there's 70 years missed, that's 70 the Shemitah years, so they went into Babylon to allow the land to rest for 70 years. Anyways, like, I don't believe that that any prophecy, supposed prophecy in the books of the prophets apply to the day. I believe every prophecy either occurred or expired. If not, it would be unbecoming of a good God because his job was to send us prophets for that generation. He never commanded us to write books of the prophets for every generation to read like like an almanac of things to come. It's, 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 well, Rabbi, uh, I don't mean to beat a dead well, horse, but uh, you said it when I asked you if the king could appoint people to the Sanhedrin that the uh, the Torah didn't say this. Like, what what did the what does the Torah say in your opinion, as opposed to the rabbinical? Uh, you know? Bless you, man. God bless you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> We're breaking up. Can you say it again? I'm sorry. Petak Tikva. Can I say it again? Free, free, Petak Tikva. Bro. Bro. Israel doesn't exist. Huh? I'm curious too. I'm just like, what is this? You're breaking up. You're breaking yeah. up, Petak Tikva. You say it again. Say it again. I'm not gonna lie. I was I was asking a question, man. No, that's fine. We're all ears, Petakikva. I mean, uh, <laughs> Petakikva is like the like the secular part of B'nai Brock. Yo, I have a question. Um, so, what do you think the Torah says in regards to kings appointing people on the Sanhedrin? It, it doesn't, unfortunately. Um, and and who does the, uh, appoint people to the Sanhedrin in the Torah? Oh, well, in the Torah, it's Moses. Okay, well, I mean, if Moses was anything, he's probably, he probably is uh, the king, I guess. I, I don't know. It says in the book like a Bible. king and a high priest at the same time. Yeah, I actually think that's true. That's why I told you there's rumors about some guy is supposed to be. Oh, chill him. out, chill out, chill out. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, so. No, not him, the other one. Oh, uh, who Melchizedek? No, the Jewish one, bro. Oh, Shabtai's fee. Oh my God! That's oh, 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 yes, 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 yes. Yeah, okay, that one. Right. But he's one of the worst ones. If you research them, Shabtai's fee is like literally. I'm, I'm interviewing a seventeen, by the way. Guys, Whoa. guys, the Messiah is Menachem Mendel Schneerson. Were they Elokistim, the uh, the Shabtai's V people? No, no but I, I think uh, okay. So I think if if Moses appointed people to Sanhedrin, I think it's totally plausible for the king to do it. Uh, oh, in, oh. If it was happen again, oh, you're you reading think? into it as much as the rabbis are. Okay, but do, do you agree with that reading in? You know, reading well, in is a the terrible thing. That oh, God no. called Moses to establish a court of 70 elders. Okay. And he says that, that he was going to put on them what he put on him. Apart from that, we don't know. You know, so in terms of, you know, because it said that Moses also put on, on Yehoshua what God put on him. So the rabbis believe this is what's called smicha. Because smicha is also, it's leaning literally so every time they would offer a sacrifice they would lean on it the, the they they would you know it's it well so they use that to transfer authority but it doesn't say that in the literal text okay um it's it's part of rabbinic literature that smicha this this authority to judge is passed down from teacher to student teacher to student okay but like the king is a temporal leader moses was definitely a temporal leader doesn't it also say that Moses listened to the Sanhedrin? Um, no, no. Um, it said, but well, the best example is when the guy is caught picking up sticks on the Sabbath, it says that he took them to the elders. I believe it says, you know, the, the temple back then was the Mishkan, the, the, the sanctuary. So the Sanhedrin during the temple would rule in a place called the Room of Hewn Stones, the, the Lishkat Hagazit. In the sanctuary, they would rule at the door of the Tent of Meeting. 
Um, and it says that that God basically told him that you have to analyze this guy picking up sticks. I don't think it was the Sanhedrin that came up, or the elders, because the word Sanhedrin. Okay. The yeah, but the elders, the elders could be understood as the Sanhedrin, and I'm well, saying yeah. if, Mo- if Moses is going to them, it does seem like Moses is a temporal leader, and I, the king is also a temporal leader. No, I mean, because the Torah never said that we need a king. The Torah no, says that's true. That, that's true. But, but the Israelites wanted a king. That's the what doesn't. Sense. But the Torah does have laws and concerning kings before there even is a king. No, right, right. No, but the Torah it's, it's says good that to have a king. But if if um, that when you appoint a king, um, that when you want a king, right? So it's an optional position among like, amongst Israel, which is why Samuel was telling um, Israel, "You don't want a king. You don't need a king." Right. No, but you just talked about like disunity in the Orthodox world. A king would solve that. Correct. The I mean, Sanhedrin would God. solve it. Technically, I mean, a Sanhedrin could put a king to death. Um, however, there was a later law passed by the Sanhedrin that they couldn't adjudicate kings, but it was a rabbinic law passed. Because according to rabbinic Judaism, the Sanhedrin has more authority than the king. Okay. Well, and, I mean, according yeah, to the Rambam, the Sanhedrin appoints the king. Well, think about it. The Supreme Court adjudicates the president sometimes. It's called an impeachment, right? So that makes sense. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's adjudicated because they can't bring criminal charges on the president while he's in office. So unless there's a certain article they could pass that it's like an aggressive crime, you know, like, yeah. So wait, you don't think, like, you should have a, we should have a king in a perfect world? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm kind of like... On Samuel's side, it seems like Samuel was a Republican, and all the people who wanted big government were on the left. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Sure. American all right, you I got, I got an easy question themselves. for you, Rabbi. I Trump, love you, Rabbi, it's, but <laughs> it, it's nationalism, though. It's it's not like it, it's not like. Uh, I got a real question. Okay, go ahead. I mean, well, I have a Rabbi. Is it, is it is it against is it against the Torah to help an animal out of a pit? You mean on the Sabbath? Right. Yes. No. Uh, yes. Yes. You mean, are you allowed to break the Sabbath say, in order to, to save the life of an animal? Are you allowed to help an animal? Right. Oh, well, right. yes. Okay, hold on. On the Sabbath, you're allowed to help an animal out of the pit. However, if by helping the animal, you're breaking the Sabbath, then no, you're not. What about a Gentile? And do you think that's correct? <laughs> Huh? Uh, yeah. Dude, I'm trying to be serious. So, yeah, no, that's yeah, a good I was question. trying to be serious that's too. Good question. Yeah, I mean, I do believe that. Yeah, that's why he laughed at the end, right? I laughed because it's a good question. I'm amused by it. Amused All right, guys, don't question. get so, so touchy, bro. Yeah. No, so I believe here these laws of the Sabbath don't apply outside of the land of Israel. In biblical Israel, there's a standard on how one keeps the Sabbath and, and, and what constitutes breaking the Sabbath. If we keep on bending these rules and saying, but it's an animal, heck, we eat animals. Okay, I but mean, it's a goy. Huh? <laughs> so, okay, well, it's two different things here. You know, no, no, I, mean, I, I think you can I break the Sabbath. I think again. you can break the Sabbath. That was my next. That was my next question. Well, is it things, going to be against the, if you do it on the Sabbath, and it's a fellow Jew? Are you okay to do that or not? Correct. Yes. Like for a fellow Jew, that like you're allowed to break the Sabbath in order to save their life. For a Gentile, you are not allowed to do that. Now. Whoa. Oh. There's a later ruling that says because of uh, hatred, um, we should violate the Sabbath and help the Gentile because it might build resentment and cause Jews to be unalive because of optics. It. It's optics. Now, no, no, correct, correct. Yeah. Now and and you know all men are created in the image of God, so I think that's no, that's another no. Proof so like I disagree with that. It's really honest of him to make it clear that that is not the reason that it is still violating the Sabbath, however, for the purposes of practicality, like David eating the showbread, it's almost this sort of kiddush or not, kind of adjustment. I'll tell you why it makes sense to me. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me, I mean, today, because now people elevate the special status of being Jewish just by simply having a Jewish mother. But if you're separating separating it by someone who holds your values, like someone who has been sensitized by Torah values versus a Gentile back then, then it makes perfect sense. 
Yeah, it's less of an issue morally. A sheep, a sheep falls, a sheep falls down a well or falls down a pit and is screaming in agony. Broke its legs, can't get up, can't do, can't do. What? What is all this? I think this is from Jesus. Fleeting. You're supposed to let it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you, should, you really should do it to establish the point. It's just an animal. Do you think? Do you think uh, that was correct, or do you think that's a bit too? F it has to be correct. Far wait, wait, wait. I believe that one's correct, guys. Mm -hmm. I yeah, mean, I wasn't asking you as I seen you, Rob. All right, chill, bro. Okay. It sounds like you're in a bad mood today, Fizz. This is the yeah. first time I've seen you with this with this demeanor. I mean, I'm answering honestly. I am. Okay. I am. Imagine I mean, I have no issue killing animals. I mean, I'm a hunter, by the way. Okay. I mean, I could, you know, I mean, skin a deer in like 30 minutes for you, and that's long, according to some hunting buddy. Okay. That's now, not the question. That's no, I'm telling take you, longer because I hate deer. My gosh, I'm trying to lay down a precedent here. Okay, that above all, my Sabbaths you shall keep. Okay, God takes the violation of the Sabbath very seriously. Now. Would I violate the Sabbath today to save the life of a Gentile? 100% I would, 100%. Because I believe that Gentiles today are not the same as Gentiles back then. I believe that. And even the rabbis make a distinction that even within Christianity, it's a different type of idolatry. Okay, I mean, it's not the same. Back then, being an idolater was synonymous with being an unethical individual. It was synonymous. This is pre-Islam and pre-Christianity, all right? I mean, Christians and Muslims might as well be in the covenant as well, because they've been sensitized by the commandments of this covenant it's not the same i don't believe in prolonging the life of my enemies and back then if someone was an idolater they were your enemy now when you have an open door policy that someone could become jewish in a day which is what the law actually is then why that why would you be prolonging the life of people who essentially want to harm you right makes sense Okay, I now in terms of an normal. animal, I love animals. I have dogs and I have cats and all this stuff, but God said, don't violate the Sabbath. I mean, perhaps, I don't know, we should cover up holes and pits, you know, for animals not to fall mm. in it. But to say that I'm gonna violate the Sabbath just because, you know, I mean, perhaps like people should guard their animals a little better, right? I mean, but once you start like violating this law and that law, before you know it, everything is subjective, you know? So then, I mean, I get it. For an animal, I get it. For a human, I don't, okay? And honestly, like even back then, I would probably end up saving the Gentile also. I mean, I have no issue acknowledging that I break Torah laws. Do you, um, did you see Dinesh D'Souza's debate with Alex O'Connor? No. I do. Okay. I have a question. Uh, I have to leave soon. I pray that you'll, uh, okay. Uh, anyway, so there's, there's a, I've been read. I've read the Bible. I've began reading Genesis or I've read the Bible in Hebrew to a degree, to the extent that I'm very marginally literate. And I get the sense relative to the King James English that what's rendered in Hebrew, while even if the things that are being stated, like X did Y on this day, there is a stylistic element in English that does not seem to exist in Hebrew. There is a sort of, uh, and I, I, there's a, almost a, a flourish in English. Maybe it's just because I understand English and I, and the, it seems complex-ish, whereas Hebrew seems not. If I when I read uh, and so on, when I read this, it doesn't. It just seems more blocky. It's, it feels more cave. It doesn't seem as. Uh, it seems primitive in communication. It seems more direct and without a kind of uh, excess or musicality. Is that just due to my limited understanding of the nuances of Hebrew and the Nikud and how these? different things convey the greater detail or is this a difference in what is a what is communicated in hebrew than what is in biblical hebrew than what's communicated in king james english is there is don't there look a for, don't look for accuracy and grammar in biblical hebrew it breaks mm -hmm. the rules all the time this is why israelis have a hard time like reading the Torah straight through because it doesn't follow the rules of grammar past tense, present tense, command form, it, it's, it goes back and forth. While Eliezer ben Yehuda and all the people who sharpened up modern day Hebrew had rules that they developed, that they stuck to, which I mean, worked most of the time in the Torah, right? But wouldn't work in the prophets. You know, it's, it's, it, so yeah, I mean, I, it, it's, it's complicated. I mean, it's for sure complicated for me 
And I lived in Israel for five years, but I mean, like my excuse is that I'm a convert. You know, I mean, I was deprived of a like of a hater education. Gotcha. Yeah. So there's there's breaking the rules in such a way uh, in grammar in such a way that that convolutes or makes irrational or makes illogical a message, and there's breaking the rules of grammar in a way that that makes it a message even more clear uh, and more specific, better than the grammatical rules would otherwise allow, like, she be going, she be running, she be running. Well, it's, it's saying that she ran in the past, she's running now, she'll likely be running in the future. That actually does convey more information than she is running or was running or whatever. Is it, is it a similar dynamic in uh, the Torah or is it know. maybe just a I'm not an expert in this of... area. I mean, I can't really okay. You know, I mean, I know the rabbis in the Talmud call Greek the beautiful language because they viewed it as superior to their own language. Now, this is pre-Kabbalah, uh, but it's true. In Greek, there's five different words, you know, for one concept. Yeah. Sure. Well, like in Hebrew, it's a lot more limited than that. Um, yeah. Anyways. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you for uh, entertaining this question, even though at the expense of your other two more interesting panelists, I apologize. No, right. no, that's fine. I, here, look, I was on the topic of the idea of breaking laws. It's better to break laws than to deny that laws exist. Mm. Like, and people do this all the time. They'll reword it. I mean, I remember I was uh, in Clubhouse, and then this guy, Rabbi Litvin, who like really hates my guts. And so I don't care if people hate my guts, but when they at the same time, refuse to debate me, that's when I lose respect for them. Yeah. But then, I mean, somebody asked the question, what penalty is there for unaliving a Gentile according to Jewish law? And then like, we were both in the same live, and then I said, I'm sorry that I have to say this, but according to Jewish law, there is no penalty, no earthly penalty. And then he started yelling, I'm a liar, I'm a charlatan. So I'm like, so what's the law then? You're a liar, you're a charlatan. So I'm like, what's the law? And then either he didn't know right uh but he felt that it's better to deny that a halacha exists um than than uh to look bad i guess in judaism uh but it's true according to jewish law it says that you're high of misa but that you're liable the death penalty like by the hands of heaven mm. now I'm not saying that. Yeah, that makes sense as a national law in a scenario where in which the Jews are a nation surrounded by potentially hostile nations. Uh, well, I mean, this was a law that would have existed when there was a Sanhedrin and Jewish sovereignty. So you figure, you know, I mean, there must be a way to. Um, For sure. More I mean, diplomatic. I'm not saying that I like that ruling, by the way, but I'm not going to deny that it's there. Because if I do, and someone becomes my friend because of it, and then they realize that I lied to them, the first thing they're going to think is, what else did I lie to them about? So we first tell the truth always, and then we give our opinion. And so, like, I have no issue acknowledging that if I had a, a, a friend who happens to be homosexual, let's say, and acts it out, that I wouldn't be dragging him to the Sanhedrin. Okay. I mean, although God probably wants him, you know, because of the Toeva, he wants him to be unalived. I'll say I'll break that law. Yeah. Uh, However, is, like, oh, I wouldn't God. deny that that law exists. Yeah. What is the, what's the term for, is there a term? So there's, there's halakha, there's a halakha, which is to say uh, a legally obligated behavior or principle or something. What is the term for like the spirit of a law, a, the, the philosophy behind the law, like the logic behind it? The what? It doesn't exist. It's a Christian idea, but Jews use it a lot. The spirit okay. of the law. Uh, the like in principle. Hebrew, it doesn't. It doesn't, um, doesn't exist. No, just because. Well, one, the Sanhedrin wouldn't take it into account, right? Okay. I mean, like, the Sanhedrin is not there to, in some way. They're there to interpret the law, but they don't take sympathy into account. They're... There's one notion called the Tinoch Shanishba, which is not really on the Sanhedrin, but on people in other ways, like in other words, dragging people to the Sanhedrin or, or coming to conclusions about a person's existence. A Tinoch Shanishba is literally someone who has the status of a kidnapped child in Judaism. So 
we're a bit more patient with them than we would be with someone who actually knows better. Um, so the Ramam com- concludes that section of the laws of Atino Chinishba that we don't run to unalive him. In other words, we walk to unalive him. So <laughs> the law is the same that they have to be unalive for breaking the Sabbath or doing whatever in biblical Israel, but we have discretion on how we execute this law. But so judges would in some way, like, if they saw that it just wasn't the guy's fault, and for sure, like even in Judaism, for you to be on a light for something, there has to be something called hasra. So, I mean, hasra is pre-warning, but they have to tell you, do you know what you're doing, right? In the presence of two witnesses, you have to acknowledge that, yes, you know. And only when you acknowledge that is when they're able to unalive you, to a certain extent, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's no, I mean, unless someone wants to come up and chime in on the notion of the spirit of the law in Judaism, I'm not familiar with it. Is Mesorah like, maybe in any way similar to that? No, I, I mean, Mesorah is just like a tradition. I mean, it's, it. it's a... Which doesn't have some sort of transcendent property. It's just the tradition of that interpretation. Mm, so, I mean, Mesorah also doesn't really mean tradition either. I mean, it's used by Rishonim to say, this is my Mesorah. It's the way they're able to answer ambiguous rulings in the Torah. I mean, I'm mean, not in the Torah, but in the Gemara in particular. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes we don't know like, which way like a, a halacha goes. Like the Rosh will say it's this way, the Ramam will say it's that way. Why? Because they'll have their own Masora on what was the final din there. Mm-hmm. Well, unless Bernie wants to chime in uh, and, and uh, contribute to the conversation, Bernie. How are you? So, good, Bernie. Good. Uh, okay. I'm just listening a little bit, just to catch a little bit of uh, where you're at in the conversation, so I can. Um, you can contribute the comments I make, I, which I can contrib- uh, which I can contribute to. Uh, I was just listening, and I picked uh, up on the last thing. So I just give me a few minutes. And Masora is more handed down tradition, Masora basis. Right in modern yeah. day Hebrew, you know, but a Masora back then wasn't. You know, for example. Um, that we don't do anything in Judaism. I mean, in, okay, that we do nowadays. Like, if someone has a weird practice that they take into, the, like, where they bring to shul with them, they'll say, like, it's my Masorah. It's like my people in Yemen. And then, you know, like, okay, so, in, like so we, are we talking about today's times or are we talking about back then? Let's take that separately. Because well, right, I'm bringing up game. both because most of the time, like, people say Minag or they'll say Masorah. It means something different today than it meant in the time of Chazal. Like, it seems like you're saying it was something more mundane in times of Chazal, but well, it seems for, like well, everything was more mundane in times well, of Chazal. Well, don't forget different real. times. One thing I learned very much, um, as I'm learning lately, recently a lot, is that when you read the Gemara or you read the Talmud or you're reading two opinions from people from a certain time, you have to take in context the time, the situation, what was going on in that time, how they judged, and so on and so forth. That's why we have rabbis through the years and take a lacha, the rabbi would I think would agree, as times change, as modernity comes about, how we could live amongst these times, halachically. Right, but so that, that changes, so it's malleable. In other words, you, they argue and then they continues. And obviously we have certain foundations that we don't change from like, because we don't have the law, That's we don't law. have the people and the capability to change those laws. Can I, can I just say something real quick? There definitely are um, differences between different groups, depending on, you You can see uh, Jewish law evolve depending on the location. You know, Yemenites obviously have different minagim uh, and different interpretations of halakha than uh, someone in uh, Western Europe. Correct. Um, so, yeah, you see that evolution based on uh, the needs of the community. Uh, to a certain extent, I mean, you can't change a halacha. I oh, mean, absolutely, absolutely. You see changes. Uh, the like amount of exactly. hours that you wait, the amount of hours you wait between milk and meat, for example, the oh, crazy on differences second. between. Wait, 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 one, second, on, one second, on, one second, one second. If I may say so. So nowhere yes. in the Gemara, I mean, does it tell you to wait six hours? That's okay. First of all, okay. I just want yeah, but yet yeah, there are differences between communities and how they yeah, evolve. Yeah. Because it's not a halacha to begin with. I mean, the halacha is that there has to be a separation between, you know, bus and halacha. You know, but the yeah, how long of a separation not... do you hold, Rabbi? <laughs> uh, I plead the fifth, but I, <laughs> but but I'll tell you, 
I play the fifth. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Like in the Gemara, in the Mishnah, it doesn't tell you how long to wait. The understanding is that, that you either have to brush your teeth, drink some water, there has to be a separation. You know, the Rambam says around six hours. The Ramah says one hour. Yek is today, wait three hours. Dutch Jews wait one hour. You know, but the Gemara doesn't give a separation. I mean, I understand that. You know, in my tradition, my tradition, which is Ashkenazi, my parents are European and on and on. Uh, as a kid, I was really naive because I thought you had to wait six hours until I, you know, did a little more learning and I was taught more that six hours was only for certain type of cheeses, which were um, Whoa, wait, wait. Fermented. A, regular, a regular slice of white uh, of, of American cheese, you don't wait no six hours. No, wait, wait, wait. I mean, you're confusing the topic here. That's I know, but I'm just saying the waiting, meat, the difference. Like, between meat and cheese. Um, and well, the wait between the two depends on what type of cheese. So for yeah. hard cheeses, yes, for hard cheeses, there has to be a separation. You know, like yes. Parmesan is a hard cheese, mozzarella Correct. cheese is a soft cheese. Correct. But I mean, from meat to dairy, I mean, it's the argument. It seems like the differences between the different minhagim are not based on, are not are, are kind of geographically contingent and not based on any particular differences of a, a sort of different philosophical dif view of things. It's just different views on just different views on the answer in a in a particular uh, sense. You know, it's a combination of both because and, and, and sometimes I, 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 I try because, to make it one moment uh, yeah. and I want to hear you have to say it seems as if sometimes. I try to interpret what you're saying, Asher, and then you cringe in, in, in what I, what no, I. No, no, uh, I'm <laughs> My eyes are. Yeah, I got something in my eye. Oh, okay, for no, sure. No, That's no, what no, I tell no, her. No. Well, anyways, the halacha doesn't change. You know, there is no. You Bukharians don't walk around saying like we don't have to. You know, I mean, study masechet chulin. You know, I mean, the Talmud doesn't change. However, um, customs based off the Talmud may change, but the the laws never change. This okay. is why if a German Jew that wants to wait three hours, I mean, he could wait 100 hours because the Talmud doesn't give a separation. But if it did give a separation, then we'd all have to stick with what the Talmud says. This is why we're stuck with the two day yuntu, right? Why? Because the Talmud says that we have to keep, you know, every holiday for two days in Gullus, right? And that doesn't change. So there's another Sanhedrin. That's correct. Because of the fact that uh, even though we know in today's times, we know that the second day, we know the times, but obviously in the times then, when they send out the two witnesses and they went out to try to tell the people outside, you know, Jerusalem, they got lost. They weren't sure which day. And that's why we have to keep two days outside. And that well, has never changed. Well, and, and then, you know, talking the, about. We don't have the, the authority to do that. Even though we know with the modern calendar, we know that the second day of Yantif is technically not Yantif, but we have to keep it as it is. Well, well you know, talking about. The hagim, you know, when do you wear tefillin? You know, there are certain customs, again, men hagim, yes. that almost are like law-like. Like people had no understanding that people wore tefillin on different days during the hagim that others didn't, you know, for yeah, example. I don't, and some the Ashk and certain yeah, right. Ashkenazim do. So, again, yekis are scary, right? Because they, they throw everything at us. Go, <laughs> I think you're talking about wearing tefillin during Cholomoed. Yes, exactly. However... That's a Kabbalistic custom not to do it. Like in the Gemara, it makes no distinction between Holomed and you know, like a regular day of the week. Shabbos, of course, you don't wear tefillin or like on the actual Chag. But it's the Zohar that oh, says say that not again. to wear it. Say that again. I hit that last point on Shabbos. What? No, but we know that on Shabbos and on any of the actual Chagim, we're not allowed to wear tefillin. 100%. Right. The argument is Holomed. The Gemara doesn't make this argument. It's the Zohar, the Arizal. It's not in the Gemara. According to the... To, to, which is the Mishnah, everyone not only has to wear tefillin during Holomed, you're supposed to wear tefillin all day long. All okay, day so long. the second part I was about to bring up on the first part, my tradition was not to wear Holomod. Yeah, yeah that's Holomod. most people. That's most people. Except of, for Yekis. It's, it, it's right. okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, Israel, it's more mixed. In America, it's I would more say. Mixed. No, in America, it's more mixed. In Israel, almost nobody wears it. Litfish, I think, do. Right, lit box was uh, some really some small. I think I, I've I've not seen too many lit box wear. Listen, in, in the bottom line is we come from different backgrounds, and then we take those traditions. Some take it to, you know, the interpretation more extreme than others, but they bend it and bend it. 
It should oh. break. Oh, oh, speaking of, have you ever seen the one guy in your salon who wears like five pairs of tefillin at once? Not five. I mean, I've seen him. I think with, it's like, five pairs. I mean, there's a guy. Is it the stike wear? Like, who's the guy who has like a hundred pairs? Hundred of- senses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, long, he's not around anymore. I happen to meet him, by the way. Yeah. Uh, uh, very interesting. But again, this is you know. Scheinberg, I, isn't it, Rev Scheinberg? Scheinberg, yes, yeah. yes, yes. But um, yes. But Josephus, where are you from? Me, uh, I'm from everywhere. I'm from uh, ancient Rome mostly these days. Yeah, I know, but I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm from the collapse right now. I'm watching. You're the, you to play know, Jewish yard I don't want to go. I don't want to get into politics right now. You know, I mean. <laughs> no, Josephus. <laughs> after th- after three uh, drinks, I'm I'm in character. You know, right now. Uh, uh-huh. in character. So there's Jewish geography. You know, everybody knows <laughs> someone in the Jewish world. So Bernie's from Borough Park, right? So where are you from? No, no, no. You're no, from no. Okay, uh, okay. Well, Guess I was, no. I was okay, born. I'll tell you. I grew, up, I grew up in Borough Park till 20, and then I moved to Flat, mid Flatbush until four years ago. So I'm Brooklyn born and raised no matter what part. Yeah. So, somewhere between the Mediterranean basin and the Midwest. That's where yeah. I'm from. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like Avenue, what Avenue? Avenue J? No. I lived on Avenue K and East 16th Street. I mean, I'm born in Passaic. Actually, uh, my my nephew lives in Passaic. But when I was born in Passaic, it's not what it is now. I mean, no, now it's like uh, Lakewood. when I lived in Borough Park, it's not what it is now. <laughs> yeah, Passaic's like Lakewood. When I was there, it was just Puerto Rican. And... All right, now it's you can't buy a house. Right. But anyways, uh, all right. So Josephus, I mean, tell us a little about your like. There aren't too many religious Jews who come on this live. There aren't too many religious Jews on TikTok as it is. Okay, I, I mean, I think this may be the only interactive Orthodox live. I think you know, Rabbi Littman does one, whatever. Um, yeah, there's there's one other guy I've been to, uh, but I think he's mostly running it during Tishbav to like avoid passing out. Yeah. So. so, but this is this is a. I mean, I'm modern Orthodox, but I consider myself a rationalist. I'm big on the Rambam. I'm not big on Kabbalah at all. You could, you know, I'm not against people studying it. I just, I'm, uh, I'm in what's called uh, like Nigla versus Nister. Like, I, 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 uh, I don't think you can really put anybody in a category today. Oh, I could easily. What is that about? It's easy. No, I mean, you, I just, you, just, the you just said a modern Orthodox and then went on to three or four different variances. Well, most most modern Orthodox Jews like Lidbox are more rational. You know, like I, I consider people. myself modern Orthodox, but I grew up very Orthodox. But I'm Orthodox. I'm just more open minded, more see the world. I am not, you know, I'm not as I'm not as extreme. I'm not a nutcase. I'm yeah. right Orthodox, down the middle. Yeah, because we're declaring uh, yeah, yeah, you'll as 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 nutcases, and my son. No, goes no, no, no. I'm not going to go that far because well, there are different chassidim. I'm not going to go that far. Some are, some are. Yeah, I, I, I'm just Jewish, but I try to balance the rational with the uh, mystical, the basically. Yeah. Okay. To each his own. You know, that's that's Judaism. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I mean. Very easy to say that, I guess, flippant to say that, but I, I think we are, we are a people, phases. we are different, and especially mm-hmm. religiously at whatever level you are, whether you're from uh, from the Syrian community or for the Bukhari well, like community that. and this community, everybody has their own. Now, there's some that are better than others. I mean, Syrians, because I'm a convert myself. I told you, I converted 20 yes, years. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, I, by the way, Rabbi, I was thinking about you after I hung up. And just thinking about your story and 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 now I, I I've encountered a lot of people in my life. I don't think I encountered somebody like you. Oh wow, that's converted crazy. and became a rabbi and uh, that's that's not too. So Syrians don't accept converts. I don't know if you know this. Say yeah, that again. That's true. Syrian Who? Jews do not accept converts. Which Jews? Syrian Jews. They also don't like the Vuz Vuz either. Uh, was that like Russian Jews? Oh no, the Vuz Vuz are like Satmar. No, they don't like vuz vuz. They, they call all of us vuz vuz or uh, what's the other thing. Um, no, vuz vuz are like, I mean, Hasidic Jews. Like vuz vuz. I mean, it's yeah. Yiddish. Never like, heard that term. You know, in Israel, it's an Israeli term. What's the other thing they say? By the way, I heard the Bukharian community, which I'm now a little involved with business wise, for what I do. You know, I've always heard about them, but they're a culture onto themselves. Yeah, they're you got to be tough. Really you got to be real tough to be with them. <laughs> yeah, that they're uh, yeah, they're they're interesting. I I just 
recently again through business uh, met them and actually I have a nephew that married into that. I went to the wedding, I was blown away. I couldn't believe what I saw. Oh my gosh, the they spent business. so much on them. Like, 47th Street, 47th Street was, was... You ever been to a Bukharian wedding? Uh, no, I have, it's insane. Okay. Insane. Uh -huh. well, anyways, I define modern orthodoxy as doing what's required and considering what's optional. Um, okay, I gotta drop off, bye everyone. All bye. right. Okay, okay, I, I, I like that. You yeah. know, I put myself in a box. I don't even know modern orthodox fits me because I have such traditional values from my parents and my grandparents who were, you know. Well, let's talk about it. Here, look. Well, you look like a clean shaven guy, right? I mean, you have a little bit of a beard. Yeah, yeah. yeah clean shaven all my life. Nice bed of, head of hair at my age. Let, let, there's something called being firmer than Chazal or being like Hormadik. By the way, I don't like the word from. To me, that's a four letter word. Uh, well, I mean, being from Borough Park, I mean, you're from, you know. Now, I mean, you know what from like... means? From a comment, it connotates that you look at somebody, you judge them, and you think by their clothing they are from. Uh, and I don't like that because I don't believe that. I know that not to be true. What you wear is not makes you from or not. I, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, judge me on how I look and not how I behave. Right. Um, I, I don't mean that to knock you, but that's my personal. Oh, but I don't consider myself. I, I mean, I say I'm from, you know, but in the Jewish world, it just means that you're Shomer Shabbos and Shomer Kashras. Right. I mean, uh, however, yeah, in the it's world, thrown, it, 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 I guess I grew up within it so much. So it's thrown around like, but I, I've been, you know, I've been up and around living in this community, working in the community. Not everybody who you see is what they are. And, and not all the people who you think they're not. But they really are some. Oh well, no, I get it. I get it. I'm I'm not impressed with big hats and long beards. I actually have this this standard that the bigger the hat, the longer the beard, the less impressive the individual. It's not a coincidence that the biggest rabbis, and it like it might be because I'm biased, but like the Herschel Schechters in the world, you know, like the Rav Aaron Rakafets, you know, like the YU rabbis are typically more clean shaven, more they look normal, more normal, and are typically um, more knowledgeable, like the Nate like the near Israel is like of the world, like versus the more, I mean, those who focus more on how they look with the long, like a Becca show or a Reckle. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to say something. Let me, I just wanted to give you a little story. I was a gabai and a president of a little steeple in Flatbush for uh, 30 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's small. People, they were old, old, most, I got, when I got married, my father and my were there, so I went there. They were all, you know, that age, I was the young buck over there and some others. And over time, short time, I took over and then I became the president. And so small, holy, really nice. And it was my job. And I always respected the rabbi. We didn't, when we got a rabbi, we would always searched for a rabbi that was down to earth, didn't have an ego way up there that you can talk to on the same level and hopefully understand you on the same level. So I, during my tenure, I hired two rabbis. One was in Kiravol's life, Olvashalom Rabbi Schwartz, and he used to love football and he was such a, I used to go to Shurim. He was so knowledgeable. And the combination of that, it's like Rabbi Breidowitz almost, the combination of being able to relate to you and learn on your level and explain as opposed to somebody that sits up there and gives you a servant and talks down to you. And he's got to have all his, you know, everybody is covered, you know, his ego. I give you a good example. When I got married, I davened by a Rebbe in a shtibel, and my father had a problem and he couldn't give the, the, the main covered to one or two. So because the other one didn't get it, didn't come to the wedding because <laughs> if I'm not coming to the wedding, I'm not getting a couple. I'm not coming. So that type of thing has really uh, sent me in a wrong way, that attitude. So I look for somebody that, you know, is not. You mean during the Sheva Brachas? I'm sorry? You mean during the Sheva Brachas? No, at the wedding, the chuppah. Right, no. You're in the chuppah, yes. Brachas, the first time. Yes. Yeah. yeah so no, you well, it's it's more than that. It's, I don't think he got Masada condition. Ah, okay. Uh, something else. Yeah, whatever. 
but you understand what I'm, that's in the Hasidic yeah, world, yeah. you know, that in the Hasidic world, the Rav, Rav has to get shishi every week, you know, that's where I come from, yeah. you know. You have to be I, to your my father taught me, my father was very humble, quiet, a wonderful, I, I, you know, it's my father, but he was so special. And he taught me a lot. He led by example. He taught the meaning of respect, honor, and honesty in business and world. And uh, those lessons are passed down to my children, and they're so valuable, and I cherish them. And that's where I come from. That's my background. And and today, as I've grown up, and I meet other families, and and uh, not everything is kumbaya. Okay. And uh, I have a question. It's alien to me, but now, unfortunately, it's life. Okay, welcome, J5. What's up? Yeah, um, I'm just, I've been listening to your live since the other day. I'm just curious, what, did, you're converted to Judaism or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what was your original faith or the faith you grew up in? So, I was born into Catholicism. Um, and then my mother became Protestant when I was around 11 or 12. And um, when I was around 21, I ended up converting to Judaism. So, uh, yeah. Wow, that's interesting and fascinating. But, but what is the reason why you converted to Judaism? Uh, the Gethilta fish, you know, with the crane and the little... Uh, <laughs> Give him the real answer, though. <laughs> so, I mean, I was a religious Christian. Okay. I became Jewish, and then I stopped believing that Jesus was was God or the Messiah. So I felt like, where do I go from here? Like the notion, like the Sheva Mrs. Ben Noach wasn't a thing back then. I mean, this is 25 years ago. So I I grew up in Miami Beach. So I was always surrounded by Jewish people. So I went to my local synagogue, and three years later, I became Jewish. That's it. Oh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So after I converted, I made Aliyah. And I lived in Israel for five years. I married an Israeli. Wow. Which I'm not married anymore. <laughs> which which uh, settlement did you live in in the West Bank? Oh, yeah, so I lived in a place called Kohava Shachar, which is, uh, so, it, so Jews in Israel don't call the West Bank the West Bank. That's what- Judea and Samaria, Right, Samaria. right. So this technically wasn't the Yehudah Shamron. it's um, Benjamin. Um, I guess uh, to be technical, but yes, I guess you can call it Yehudah Shomer. Uh, yeah, it's called Kohava Shachar. It's like uh, my two children live in the in the Gush. All right, yeah, okay. So that's south. That's um, like who's the guy, Rabbi Riskin? He's, he's, yeah, uh, right. They right. They live right there. So my where my daughter lives, both of my daughters are right near Rabbi Riskin Efrat, across the road. That's it. You guys are are zealots. So it's, it's interesting. I was a Kahana guy for a while. I mean, I actually ran Kahana.org for five years. And I spent some time in Kafar Tapua. I, guess, I mean, only Israelis would know about this, but only like the real, you know. Have you ever met Rabbi Kahani? No, I'm a young guy. I'm not. I did. Know, Kahana. I did. Uh, oh, well, I mean, he was on a, like, he died when? In the 90s, wasn't it? Long time ago. But I know him when I was much, much younger. Uh, I met him and I didn't meet him in a situation, but uh, I did have the honor to meet him. Yes, he was, he was. Oh, yeah, every Jew at 22. That was the first stage. Uh, listen, we, we, we grew up, it was rough those days. For so you're, you're not a, uh, you're not a Kahani, Kahanist anymore? Who, me? Yeah, you. No, no, like I respect Mer Kahana. I don't identify as a Zionist. I don't think he did either. Right, it's like most most settlers don't identify as Zionists because it's that when what? the government what? when the government comes around and it tears down their settlements, I I mean they're not waving Israeli flags. Like I was there doing Gush Katif, so Gush Katif was like the biggest split that I've ever seen amongst the Jewish people. Yes, that was heartbreaking. Yeah, this was two thousand and four. I remember it well. Yeah, so the soldiers refused. Re religious soldiers refused to serve. And they it basically was, got the Russians. The Russians in Israel are, I mean, there's even like Yahtzees that are Russian in Israel. And, and they'll say that I'm not Jewish, I'm Israeli. Uh, listen, it was heartbreaking. It, well, I, 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 I get it. It was, it was what it was. I, no, but it shows that these settlers, and these are the hardcore settlers, because Gush Katif was in Gaza. 
Um, these guys didn't identify as Zionists. I mean, why do you say that? Because to identify with Zionists means that you endorse the government. That, no, no. These I are the Judea agree. of Samaria guys. I, but there was a movement that that started off by a bunch of hilltop settlers called the Kingdom of Judea. That That's an offshoot. Let's talk just generally. What does Zionism mean? What's the definition of Zionism? So it's been redefined many times. So, I, so I I'm talking about Herzl Zionism. Zionism, as I know it, is the right for the Jewish people to to live in their ancestry homeland. So that's not the original definition of Zionism. The original definition of Zionism. I'm mean, definitely like Herzl that was willing to settle. What definition you give me? Herzl had a different reason altogether. Yeah, you know, So that's different. I want to than intervene here with, with that statement. Uh, I guess Bernie said. Can you repeat that again? The definition of Zionism. My definition? I guess. I mean, you, 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 you stated it. Yes, I stated that it's the right of the Jewish people to have self-determination de self de in their ancestral homeland. Okay. But don't you think they, ha they should have a right to live anywhere else in the world? Yeah, of course they do have a right. We've been living all over the world for okay. all these millennia. Okay. So... I don't like the word Zionism like anti-Semitism being redefined. So most Haredim, let's say, like most in the like in the black hat well, yeshiva system are not anti-Zionist. They're what's called non-Zionist. And that's more my approach that they'll live in Israel. I mean, they'll even vote in Israel, but they won't say Hala during your Matzma'ut. They they won't say the Tafilah in Medina. Right. But that doesn't mean that they don't support the state of Israel. That means they support it from a secular perspective, but not from a religious perspective. So this is why we believe the word Zionism is a dirty word. There's a lot of history that gets whitewashed if we as religious people now endorse a movement that was very anti-religious at its core. It may be different now. Uh, OK, so that's what I wanted to say. I want to say that very clearly, just because the founders of the state of Israel was secular and did not want a religious state. And they were against uh, religion at that time, which is given as the reason to be against the state of Israel. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you are. Guess how old I am. Obviously, through time, You're fired turned out to be not what they intended, because look at Israel today. Freedom of learning, choose freely to go, however religious you want to be. So what? was said in 1948 doesn't apply over the last, I don't know how many years. So you can't, that, that can't define Zionism just because of what somebody said about 1948, because it doesn't. I have nephews that went to yeshiva and they had that same feeling. This is 20 years ago. And today they have a different outlook because they realize Israel is not the same it was in 1948. Yeah. But this is still the majority approach by Haredim. Well, again, Haredim across the board, there's many levels. So uh, you take the Rabbi Breidovitz of the world, you call him a Chayr. Uh, he's great, right? He's he's but he's pro-Israel. He's pro-Israel, supports Israel, and yeah, tries to unite the community. Israel, you don't identify as a Zionist. I doubt he identifies as a Zionist. I doubt it. Uh, I, I didn't ask him straight, but everything he says walks like a duck, quacks like yeah, a duck. Sure. You know what yeah, he said? Like the Torah. He said it's not, he said, just think about it. After the Holocaust, 1945, after we were six million, and three years later we have a land, back to a land. You explain that to me. No, okay, I'm not saying he's anti-Israel, but he just doesn't identify. No, he said him. that. He says, you think it comes from nothing? You think, you know, he believes God runs the world, and I do too, oh. I do as well. So I don't know how you want to put it, whether you call it a miracle. I could almost guarantee you that he doesn't say hollow during your month's vote. That could be. I don't. I'm not going to. I'm not going to misjudge him. I'm not going to. No, but that doesn't mean you're anti Israel. I'm too old. I'm too old for that. If you don't want, I do. If where I go in Crown Heights, they don't. But they do say every Shabbat. We say for prayer for the Medina. We say prayer for the soldiers. We say prayer for the hostages. Crown Heights? No. Yes, in Crown Heights, in a Chabad shul. So and I pray every Shabbos. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, but it's not even in their sitters. I don't think in Tequila's a shell. No, we, we, hello. 
it's not in general sitters. When we had the uh, Michigan. But there's a black art squirrel and there's a brown art squirrel. So it appears okay. in the black. This is a Chabad, like... just to take away a little bit of your the myth. Chabad Shul in Crown Heights, which I attend, which is, which is sort of like a mixture, okay? Mm -hmm. Every Shabbat, every Shabbat without fail. And we recently added, and since the war, the hostages, we added on that. I don't know who composed it. We say that as well. You know why it's a problem? And it's not like an anti or pro-Israel. There's actually a halacha, not to say bekashot on Shabbat. That means you're not supposed to say tachanonim. You're not supposed to ask God for things on Shabbat. So this well, is- Well, we ask him when we pray every day in the Siddur. No, no, every day, yes, on and Shabbat. Shabbat too. Huh? What? On Shabbat too. Without, no, I mean, no, without. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. So there's parts of the Amida, like like Sim Shalom, that you're asking God, but that's because the Sanhedrin themselves put it in there. But the Sanhedrin made a law that, that you're not supposed to say Tachanun on Shabbos. So, I mean, Tachanun means any type of supplication. Uh, so this is why you're not supposed to say Mishaberachs. I mean, you're not supposed to say a lot of things that people say, and this is one main reason that people don't say the prayer for the soldiers and the prayer for the state, because you're asking for things on Shabbos. And it goes again. I mean, just ask your rabbi about this. I'm not making it up, right? But this I is will. Just, I one will. reason why like many rabbis are against it, because there's a rule, you know, like, that whether you're pro-Israel or not. And the Haredi guys who are pro-Israel- are, are, are you allowed to make a, so you're not allowed to make a bishop bear for a cholam or a cholam? Correct, correct, but you're not supposed to. Because I have never in my life encountered you, a duel yeah. from every left to right that doesn't do that. No, never. I, no, I get it. I, I mean, there's things you're like. I bricks really haven't. Have I mean, you I, say bricks may on Shabbos. I'm sorry. Bricks may. Bricks may. No, uh, first of all, I don't because I'm I have inspired, and I read. I don't say bricks may. Oh, bricks. Just one second. I don't want to get confused. Just. Uh, just had a brain loss. I don't say what, Baruch Shemay, just yeah, finish the word. Like it's right before they take out the Sefer Torah. Yeah, yeah, we do. You do, okay, all right. No, because I mean, a lot don't either, like, and that's the original. It's a later addition to say, because it's from the Zohar. You're like, I want to tell you something, Torah. all the Sedurim all Zohar. come from the Arizal. No, Sakhari is from the Arizal, Safar is from yeah. Arizal. Ashkenaz from Rizal, he took bits and pieces and switched them all around. And boy, was I confused because they asked me to daven the Shabbos for the Yomit, where I went upstate for the weekend, and they daven Ashkenaz. All my life, I'm sparred. And then I come to Crown Heights. I'm finally adjusting to Nusachari, which is then, and then they hit me to Ashkenaz. I didn't know where my left was from the right. Mm. <laughs> Saying it, there's so many differences. But yeah, so Nusach. Sfard yeah. was supposedly invented out of nothing. It's a combination of Ashkenaz and... and, and well, it's, uh, it's bits and pieces taken from the Arizal. It's right, right. all from the Arizal. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's the Hasidish and Nusach. Yeah, that's what I grew up with. What can I say? Did you know that Natura Karta... Oh, yeah. Natura Karta is Litvish, and they daven Nusach Ashkenaz. Like in the, like in the, like in the. Well, I'm going to tell you something interesting. Being in my years of New York, the lad tidbit the stories. The founder of Nuri Karta, his name is Rabbi Weiss. That Rabbi Weiss grew up with me in Karastir. His parents were Holocaust survivors. They were friends of mine, went to Torvadas, which was a somewhat modern school. I mean, it wasn't Kassidish. And I don't know what happened to that guy where he went off into a planet of unknown to be Natura Karta. I, I approached him many times. I was like talking to the wall because he gets me so angry. His father's turning over in his grave for what his son has done. And I know him personally, grew up with him. I can't explain it. He just went off a deep end like other people do. Well, and he- Gosh, I wouldn't say it's modern. What? <laughs> But I mean, Torvadas, okay, it's, I'm not saying modern, yeah. yeshivish, light yeshivish, let's put it that way, at that time. Today it became much more to the right than when I grew up, okay? So, uh, so I've met like David Weiss, or Rabbi David Weiss, and like, his rabbi, Rab Moshe Beck. Once I davened, like in the Natura Karta Shu and Muncie before it burned down, like, I don't know, some kids were playing with Why me. would you do that? 
<laughs> because it was like meeting O.J. Simpson. Wait, I took a picture with him. <laughs> I, I mean, I think. Uh, yeah, I want for sure. To know something. I was driving in Muncie, and he was on the corner with three of his buddies yelling some kind of crazy stuff. And usually I can't get so close to him. When I saw him, I took a U-turn, pulled right into the parking spot, and I let loose all my anger at him right in front of him. Your father, and he knew who I was. And I was talking to the wall. He is so indoctrinated in his belief, nothing could change him. And I walked away in a huff. I didn't account, I was like talking to the wall, and I left. And that's it. But he is, a, thank God, the Tory Carter is just a fringe group. And they are disgusting. What can I say? They're not normal. If they're going to stand with Palestinian people with a talus and wear their, and uh, it's not normal. I, I, I'm sorry if I'm over. No, you no, know, you're, 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 you're. I mean, I'm they do. Very aggravated. It aggravates me to no end. So most people don't know that the Tur Karta, apart from just being anti the state of Israel, they're very anti-abortion, which I'm, I'm, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big pro-life guy. Wait a minute. Boy, do you go from topic to topic. I love that. No, <laughs> it's 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 I'm trying to find something good that they do, by the way. Well, halakhically, abortion is allowed in here certain situations. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. OK, so I disagree. Also, like that's halakha. Oh, that's halakha. OK, hold on. We'll talk about this in a second. Like, you know, Rabbi, the Rabbi Yehuda Levin. I've heard the name. All right. So he's also like like a big abortion guy. Why would you think that abortion is allowed in halacha? It's allowed under certain extent if it, it has. Oh, well, wow. has certain if it's uh, right. It's if it's dangerous. a road death, right? Okay, whatever you want. To go. Okay, go ahead. Well, I mean, for those who don't know, what uh, if we classify the baby a road death? A road death is like a pursuer. If the baby is technically going after the life of the mother, we save the mother over the child. Unlike the Catholic Church, that'll save the the child over the mother. Right? That doesn't mean it's allowed. Now, when I lived in Israel, I heard in my yeshuv that it's common, unfortunately, for many Orthodox women to get abortions. Why? Because their rabbi could give them a heter to get an abortion based on, like, based on the Yavitz. So the Yavitz was Rav Yaakov Emden, who said traditionally, in order to save the life of the mother, we would allow an abortion. However, he interpreted to save for the health of the mother. And, but I mean, he's not a Tana. He's not, I mean, he's, he's, he's in like he's an in the minority. Uh, he's what? He's in the minority. Oh, in this case, for sure. You know, but because of that, they more liberal rabbis interpret it that now it is mental health. So if the woman says, I'm going to go nuts if I can't unalive this child, right? They'll give her a heter to have an abortion. Nebuch. I don't, I don't think most Haredim view it like this. It's not, it's, I mean, Rav Moshe Feinstein said that abortion is murder without the death penalty because he says it's equivalent to killing a trefa. So a trefa is an animal that will die on its own in six months or something like that. So he views it as, as murder uh, without the death penalty attached to it because it's like, you know, like if something's going to die on its own and you just kind of escalate its dying, it's it's that bad, but we don't unalive you. Okay, what do you think of Rob Moshe Feinstein's psaq? On on what? What you just said. Oh, I'm against abortion. So who just said pro-abortion? I'm, somebody said I'm pro-abortion. Oh, oh no, no, not me, <laughs> not me. Well, I'm, I'm very, well, I'm, I'm, I don't know. How did abortion come up? Somebody brought it up. Oh no, because Natura Carta is their big anti-abortion people like in like in the anti-abortion parades in new york they're usually always there them 11 this guy what's his name uh um rosenberg or what's this guy's name that got shot in the head um Malcolm rosenberg i think the guy's name so i mean that's that's where the leap is but that's a debate in the orthodox world because i mean as you know reform and conservative i mean for them like the fetus has the life of a pimple, you know. Yeah, like, well, I, I don't want to go down that road because that's another uh, hot push and button for me, just for traditional purposes. So I'm not going to go down that road. For educational purposes, guys, I don't endorse people going into reform synagogues. Conservative is kind of a mixed bag. 
It depends. Let, let me, well, I'm a traditionalist, like I said, and I'm very, I believe, I think a little bit, I, I think it's probably come through about the Jewish people who I think, and we've discussed this before about assimilation and um, in reformed and conservative. Well, conservative is really going down anyway, but that's besides the point. But the, the, the well, let's start from the beginning. Moses Mendelssohn, who created, who was an orthodox person, created reform movement, doesn't have a lineage left because both of his children married outside wait, Christian, wait, wait, wait. and they have never, he does not have a soul of lineage of his heritage left anymore. Wait, hold on. Moses Mendelssohn didn't create reform. Uh, whoever it was, what's his name? Uh, uh, Hess? No. Uh, Moses Hess? Hold on. No, it's not the name. It was, and there's a few, there's Isaac Lisa, that's one of the early guys. Yeah, but reform in the beginning was modern Orthodox today. I mean, the only difference was that the, like the drash was in like Yiddish instead of, or, or like in German instead of Yiddish. But that's my point, is once you start on a slippery slope, look what happens. Once you deviate, and I think you agree if you follow Allah, you start deviating and making changes as you see fit. Now, what has happened since that movement? You have reconstructionists, you have the gamut, where in some of them, the God is not even mentioned. So now, Isaac I can, Mayor Weiss. I can understand that conservative, they want to have some egalitarian, and so they say, uh, you know, the, both the avos and the emos. I understand. I mean, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. That, you know? Isaac Mayor Weiss, uh, it says here on Wikipedia as a founder. Okay. Okay, but if you read his history, his bio, you'll see that he was Orthodox and he tried a new movement and it obviously failed. Yeah, well, I mean, they got hijacked by the left, essentially. Yeah, well. Because, uh, like most people don't know that conservative Judaism was really founded as like modern Orthodoxy. Correct. But the word Orthodox was invented by the reform movement to make fun of anyone who was traditional. Uh, but it was founded in Germany. The conservative movement was founded in America. Correct. So JTS, right. which is Jewish Theological Seminary, was considered yeah. an Orthodox institution till the mid '50s that they allowed people to drive on Shabbos, and that was where the big split happened. But the yes, founders I, of Young Israel, right. all correct, all correct, yes. The founders of Young Israel were JTS grads, actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like there isn't anything apart from the driving on Shabbos that conservative Jews do that I think okay. violates halacha. I well, mean, they have the, hey, well, they have music and they, they have microphones Jews, and they have all kinds of things on Shabbat. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. So conservative Jews, mm, micro, yeah, but they have a kosher microphone now. There's this organization in Israel that makes all these gadgets. It's called okay, you think the conservative synagogue is getting that particular device? <laughs> all right. All right. You know, so from a lenient perspective, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because electricity is, is, is neither here nor there. There was a famous rabbi, I'm sure you know him, his name is Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Orbach. Sure. Like, who wrote a sefer called, um, it's called Minchat Shlomo, that, because he wanted for his mother to be able to wear a hearing aid on Shabbos. So then he, he wrote a book explaining how electricity doesn't violate any malacha. But then at the end he says that he still doesn't use it because it's his minute not to use it. Whatever. Okay, well, I want to tell you something about that because in the early nineteenth, in the early twentieth century, uh, when lighting was different, they actually had somebody in my shul, actually an older man whose father asking that you could turn the lights off and on on Shabbat, and he was from a you know very religious. This is way back when. Over the years, lighting has changed. Incandescent lighting now you have different lighting. So therefore, first of all. You know, that concept was very in the minority, but let alone later on, uh, unless there's some magic that, that, you know, you can't just turn on uh, a switch on and off if you believe in that. You just, there isn't a way. Now, there is gadgets made to work around, but yeah. I don't know if they're flipping a switch without flipping a switch, turning it on. I don't know what, how you get around that. So I've researched this topic a lot, and it was the Chazonish in the 50s who yeah. basically made it usser to use electricity. Uh, and it's, it, it, 
if you ask the average Jew on the street, the average rabbi, why is electricity not allowed? He'll probably give you a different reason. Every rabbi, right? I mean, some say it's not allowed. Uh, the what? I don't. I, 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 you know, I know there's people that are very uh, chumra, really chumra. Um, like some people don't flush the toilet on Shabbos for whatever reason. Okay, to, to that extreme. No, I'm but, not saying that there's a rabbi that'll say that. I haven't seen allowed. anybody that sleeps in the dark or doesn't have light. There's Shabbos clocks, there's things, even ultra, ultra have light. So I don't know. No, 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 right. No, no. No, I'm saying that if you ask, you know, five rabbis, they'll give you eight different reasons on on how it's prohibited, which malacha it's actually violating. Is it is it, is it, is it like molad? Is it like mate bepatish? I think they call it like make like the final blow. It's rare that you'll find a rabbi that'll call it like mamish fire. I mean, I think everyone could come to the conclusion that electricity is not fire, okay? Because it has wow. different properties. But they'll prohibit it for other reasons, like completing a circuit or some other reason, you know. So it. But again, today's technology, we don't have that issue. So for sure. I think people could acknowledge that an LED light is not violating anything. Okay, it doesn't even get hot. Um, so like you said, they have the Shabbos lamp. But the Shabbos lamp, you're not turning it off, you're like turning it and right. then it's like, right. like right. it's making it dark. Right. And there was something called the Shabbos switch that never took off. <laughs> um, there was a switch that worked on a time delay, you know, like, uh, I yeah. think it's like like a Shinui. It, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Very interesting. There are people trying to come up with ways, kosher ways to get around. You know, for those people, uh, they try. Call it on. What can I say? Yeah, it was like carrying on Shabbos. I mean, you're in, uh, like, do you hold by the Eruv and Flatbush? Yes, I do. Okay. All right. So most people don't. <laughs> but, uh, it, you, you jump into conclusion. Don't say most. Well, you know, the Frumis don't. Let's in say. Borough Park, there's different Hasidim. Some do and some don't within Bar Park. You'll see right. carriages on Shabbos with Hasidim. Well, Chabad doesn't. I mean, Chabad doesn't hold it anyway. Chabad does, Chab, Chabad does not. Well, well, I'm sorry. Most of them do not. There oh, are. Yeah. They do. Uh, 90%. I go 90% don't. I mean, I hold by an Eru that I don't hold by. <laughs> okay. Uh, listen, I mean, nobody's perfect. Nobody's yeah. perfect. And I'm not saying I check every Friday if the Eru is up or down. I don't. I, I, I just carry on Shabbos, okay? What can I say? And, and, it's, and it takes a big man to, to, to acknowledge that. I, I always say that it's better to, to break laws than to state they don't exist. No, I'm not that. Listen, I am, unfortunately, you know what? I've had a, you know, there's certain things that I, I'm pretty strict about in certain ways and certain things I'm just too lenient. Um, what can I say? I'm not perfect. I'm guilty a lot of things, but I, I try to be a good, you know, the bottom line is <laughs> I, weigh my, I weigh those things against other things and God will judge me for that at the end of the day. And your good deeds should outweigh your bad deeds. So That's yeah. right. Nobody else should judge me. Yeah, I'm not perfect. I don't strive to be, you know, I mean, I'm pretty convinced that a surat petach is not a real door. You know, like the little string, you know, like, what am I going to do? Tell my kids they can't carry, you know, like a, like a safe run Shabbos outside my house. Yeah, I get it. I, I, I understand. I understand. Well, I, where you live in Florida now, there must be Arabs all over the place. No, again, I'm not convinced that that's a kosher Arab. You know, so a surat petak is the whole little string. All right. You know, so a string yeah, is supposed yeah, to. Yeah, that's symbolic. Yeah, symbolic. Yeah, I mean, resemble. Rishisha Yochid, Rishisha Rabbim, yeah. Right, right. I mean, it's supposed to, like, resemble a door frame. Um, according yeah. to the Rambam, it's like it's not a real border, right? Um, and then the, you have a Carmelist, which is like a, like a rabbinical compromise. Whatever. Just be normal. Guys, on that note, let's go ahead and end uh, on a high note. But thank you for stopping by, Bernie. Bega benched. Algebra J5. Ash. Thank you very much. Lila Tov, and we'll meet again. I enjoyed it very, very, very much. You know, Shlomo Karbach, like you used to say, good Shabbos every day. You know, so on that note, good Shabbos. I will tell you one last thing. My yeah. wife, my current wife, yeah, her ex-husband is the rabbi of the Kalbach Shul, and uh, his, her mother, his mother, is a Kalbach. And Shlomo Kalbach was his 
I think uncle or something like that. So we are direct my my wife my wife's husband and my stepson. Uh, well, you're actually. Well, you're your wife's husband. No, my wife. I I'm remarried. I lost my wife. My oh, current. Oh, wife, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, my current wife, X, is the oh. is the Kalbach rabbi. Is the Kalbach Shul Manhattan rabbi. Got it. I don't have the patience to dive in a Kalbach minion. That's beautiful. From time to time. I hear you. Um, sometimes I mean, a little bit. It's like hearing a good chazan. I love that sometimes. Or a good Baal Filler. Lila Tov. We'll see you again. Oh.